Good evening and welcome to the next talk in our series United We Stand, Divided We Fall. Now you could argue that the title of our series is completely self-explanatory and doesn't really merit any further discussion. After all, it could be the motto of our government or of a major business corporation or even our international sports teams. Surely unity is what everyone strives for, particularly Christians. After all, don't we stand united by our faith in Jesus? But in that case, you may be wondering why we've allocated just so many sessions to this topic. Well, the answer is found in our Bibles. Page after page of our Bibles tell story after story of God's people being anything but united. From the very beginning, God's people have been a quarrelsome, and rebellious bunch, exactly the opposite of what God would have wanted from his people. This theme of disunity runs through the entire Bible, and by New Testament times, that means there was disunity in the church, surely the last place you'd expect to find it. Now hopefully, after that preamble, you will appreciate the warning contained in the title of our talk this evening. Divided we fall. Simply stated, a divided church cannot serve God as he wants and deserves. In this talk we'll be looking at Paul's words to the church at Corinth, and then relating these words to the church in general, including the church here at ABC. In other words, Paul's words apply directly to us. Now at the time of writing this letter, Corinth was a very large city in ancient Greece. It was a giant cultural melting pot of all sorts of people with a great diversity of wealth, religions and moral standards. It had a reputation for being fiercely independent and was as decadent as any city in the world today. It was an important port on the trade routes of the day and had a bustling economy. But the city's prosperity also made it right for all sorts of corruption. Idolatry flourished, and were more than a dozen pagan temples employing at least 1,000 prostitutes to satisfy the local needs. But despite their carnal valued nature, the Corinthians also loved knowledge and worldly wisdom and polished speakers. Paul had initially visited Corinth on his second missionary journey in around AD 50. And it was during his stay there that the church of Corinth was born. Although some Jews were saved through Paul's ministry and added to the church, it was primarily a Gentile church, as we can read in Acts 18. It was there in Corinth that Paul also met Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers like himself. Now, as Paul began to preach in the synagogue, many of the Corinthians that heard the gospel of Jesus believed and were baptised, including Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, together with all of his household. But as Paul continued to preach in the synagogue, many of the Jews gradually began to oppose Paul's words and chose to reject this new gospel of Jesus Christ. Despite this setback, the Lord told Paul, don't be afraid, don't stop preaching my word, I am with you, I will protect you, for I have many people in this city. And so Paul remained there for 18 months, but eventually resumed his missionary journey and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left his companions, promising to return at a later date. Now it was when Paul did eventually return to Ephesus in 55 AD that he received reports about the divisions and disturbances in the church at Corinth. Paul then responded to these reports by writing his letter that we now know as 1 Corinthians. Now hopefully that has given you the background to Paul's connection with Corinth and more specifically with the church at Corinth. Paul's letter is addressed not only to the believers in Corinth, but also to all believers everywhere. And so his message applies equally to all churches, 
and even to our lives here at ABC. Paul's intention in this letter is for us to see that not only are such divisions contrary to the gospel, they should be set aside because of the gospel. With this in mind, let's listen and learn from Paul's message to the Corinthian church. Now Paul opens his letter by stating his own credentials for his mission as he begins with Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now it's evident from reading through both 1 and 2 Corinthians that Paul's standing and authority as an apostle was not always recognised among the Christians of Corinth. And so in the very first few words of this letter, Paul boldly lays out his credentials where he emphasised that he is a called apostle. No, he's not one of the original 12 apostles, but he is on a par with them because like them, He was chosen by God. In effect, Paul is saying to the Corinthians of Corinth that he may not be a great orator or a distinguished intellectual, but he had come as an apostle, a messenger of Jesus Christ to them, and he came specifically by the will of God. Now we all know that Paul's original intention had been to destroy the early church. But through the will of God, Paul met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. He was saved on that road, and he was transformed from a man breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples to being a strong advocate for Jesus. It was on that road that Paul surrendered his life to Jesus and resolved to obey him from that moment onwards. Paul was still a driven man, but not driven by his old motives instead driven by the will of God to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so, as Paul wrote with the full authority of God, his word should never be ignored. In the opening of his letter, Paul refers to the Corinthian church as a church of God in Corinth. Now, by this, Paul intended to cover all the believers in Corinth, wherever they met, which would have included both large and small groups. In Paul's terminology, the Church of God in Bognor Regis would not just refer to one church, but to all believers who live in this area. Paul wants us all to understand that no single church can claim a monopoly of God's blessing, as Jesus is the Lord over all of God's churches. Therefore, what Paul says here to the Corinthian church also applies to the church here in Aldwick and to every other place where believers call on the name of the Lord. Paul sees the church as one group of believers who were all equally lost as unbelievers, and all who are now equally saved through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, Paul is careful to emphasise that the standing of the believers in Corinth and elsewhere is solely the result of the grace of God reveal through the Lord Jesus Christ. They really are no grounds for boasting, except in the person and work of Jesus. But we shall soon see, this wasn't what was happening in the Corinthian church, which was plagued with divisions and cliques. Despite these divisions, in verses four to nine, Paul continues with a positive note of thanksgiving even though he's writing to a church that has begun to listen to false teachers and who were challenging Paul's own authority, a church that condoned immorality and whose personal conflicts were being aired out before unbelieving eyes in the secular courts. In which case, how can Paul possibly give thanks? Well, he does, but not for their personal failings. Rather, Paul gives thanks to God for what he has done, and for what he will ultimately do for his children. Paul first gives thanks for the grace of God, which he has given to all believers through Jesus Christ. It is apparent from these verses that the church at Corinth didn't lack any spiritual gifts. God had provided just the right gifts for the growth and maturity and ministry of all the believers in Corinth. If the church at Corinth was failing, 
It was not due to any failure on God's part to provide for their needs, but rather a failure on their part to use these gifts as God intended. But this isn't meant to be just a letter of censure. Paul wanted the Corinthian believers to know that God would consider them blameless when Christ returns. This guarantee was not because of their great gifts or their shining performance, but because of what Jesus Christ had accomplished for them through his death and resurrection. All who believe in the Lord Jesus will be considered blameless when Jesus returns, if they have faith in Jesus. Even if that faith is weak sometimes, Jesus promises that all believers are and will be saved. And so finally we come to the divisions in the church, which are covered in verses 10 to 17. Reading from verse 10 onwards, our Bibles say this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there are no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says I follow Paul, another says I follow Apollos, and another I follow Cephas, that is Peter. Still another says I follow Christ. In response to this news, Paul urges his brothers in Corinth, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be perfectly united in mind and thought, as this simply wasn't the case at present. In verse 12, Paul identifies the disunity in the church is being caused by groups who identify themselves exclusively with one leader, as opposed to the other leaders. Now we must remember that, as yet there was no New Testament. And so the believers depended heavily on preaching and teaching for spiritual insight into the meaning of the Old Testament and Jesus' ministry through visiting preachers. Now in this large and diverse Corinthian church, as in many of our churches today who welcome visiting preachers, the believers had their own personal favourites. And of course, this can be a problem for today, as in many churches, the messenger has become more important than the message. In many cases, people seem to be preferred to be entertained rather than challenged by a heart-searching, gut-wrenching message. Now, as we've just read, in Corinth, some followed Paul because he had founded their church. Some who had heard Peter preach in Jerusalem followed him while others listened only to Apollos, an eloquent and popular preacher who had a dynamic ministry in Corinth. Although these three preachers were united in their message, their personalities attracted different people. And so at this time, the church was in danger of dividing into different factions, with each faction believing their man was the one to follow, and in doing so were saying loudly and clearly, that we are the ones who are really right with God, not you. But what of the fourth group, the one who said they were of Christ? Surely they were right. Well, actually, no, they weren't. Because in this context, they were no different to the others, as they were saying, you are so carnal, following after these mere men. We are following in the footsteps of no one less than Jesus himself. We are the ones who are really right with God, not you. Can you see that in each case these groups were setting themselves apart and above the rest of the believers? Now Paul argues in verses 13 to 17 that the division among the Corinthians over men is against the nature of the gospel and is against the ministry which Paul had presented to them earlier in Corinth. Paul then makes it clear that Jesus Christ cannot be divided between factions. You cannot cherry pick from Jesus' teaching to suit your audience. Jesus' message is complete and nothing should be added to it or taken away from it. Paul reminds the church that it was Jesus Christ who had been crucified with the Corinthians, not Paul himself or indeed any other of their leaders. It was Christ's sole responsibility 
and it was God's will that that's how it should be. Paul then made it clear that his own particular calling was to proclaim the gospel message clearly rather than to baptise people. He emphasised that the Corinthians were not baptised in the name of Paul, Peter or Apollos, but in the name of Jesus. He then makes it clear that his ministry does not revolve around baptism as a central feature, but on clearly proclaiming the gospel. Now when Paul says that Jesus didn't send him to baptise, he wasn't minimising the importance of baptism. After all, baptism was commanded by Jesus himself and was practised by the early church. Paul was simply saying that no one man could or should do everything and that his gift was of preaching. And so that's what God wanted him to do. Then and now, Christian ministry needs to be a team effort. No single preacher or teacher can ever be our sole link to God. And yet in our day, so often people think the minister should do everything. And if he doesn't, they think he's failing in his duty and feel quite at ease to tell him so. But this is totally unfair and completely wrong. All of us have been given a gift to use in God's service and at God's direction. Our role is to make sure we use these gifts wholeheartedly for God's glory, not ours. In every church, including here at ABC, there are many ministries and that is a really good thing. But let's make this very clear. No one ministry is better or in more important than any other. Certainly not in God's eyes. All of our ministries are equally important, provided they follow God's guidelines for our church. Our ministries should reflect the three guiding principles given to us by God, namely to love God, to love each other, and to love the lost. These three principles are interlinked and involve all of us, but we must always remember that they are equally important. Doing well on two out of three isn't what God wants of us. This unbalances God's work here and prevents us from being the church God wants us to be. We are not alone in this, as most churches struggle to truly love the lost. Yes, the churches might be generous in their financial support and offers of help to those in need. Yes, churches might offer social benefits such as food parcels, playgroups, coffee mornings, film nights, youth clubs and lunch clubs. All of these are worthwhile and offer practical help and practical advice. But are we really fulfilling their greatest need? Is this how Jesus would define loving the lost? Because for many people, the modern church appears to have set itself apart from its non-Christian neighbours. And many non-believers think that we perceive ourselves as better than they are. This then creates a division in our society as it introduces a notion of them and us into our culture. We're adding to this perception. If we view the church as a safe haven, we are deceiving ourselves if we think we can retreat within the church walls to escape the evils of this world. The church shouldn't be a place where we go to escape from sin. It is the place where we go to confront our sin and to stimulate each other to love and do good deeds. The church is not a Christian clean room where we go to get away from sin. It's a hospital where we can find help and healing through the ministry of God's word and prayer. The church is not a place which is kept holy by keeping sinners away. It is the place where newly born sinners are brought so they can learn the scriptures and grow in their faith. The church, any church, this church, isn't meant to be an exclusive club with a restricted membership. Rather, it's meant to be an open house where people can find Jesus through our testimonies. But is that how you see us? Let me ask you. Do you really understand how difficult it is for a non-believer to even come into the church? Do we even encourage non-believers to come to church? If we do, do we actively welcome them when they do come? 
do we make them feel welcome before, during and after the service? Do we understand how confusing church is for newcomers? Do we know how to help seekers to survive their first service? Do we intentionally invite them to all of our activities that are coming up? Do we follow them up in the week to see if they have any questions? Or do we actually think this is really Simon's job? We have to understand that in a united church, it is the responsibility of all of us. We are far from being the perfect church. But if there was hope for the Corinthians, there is hope for anyone. The first nine verses of this letter are saturated with reasons for hope. The church at Corinth seemed almost beyond hope. There were divisions, immorality and opposition to the Apostle Paul and to his teaching. Is Paul discouraged? Does Paul give up hope? Absolutely not. God is saying to us this evening, through Paul's words, we must never give up on reaching out to the lost, and that we must be united in our efforts and desire to provide for their greatest need, and that is knowing that Jesus loves them unconditionally. We must not get discouraged if our efforts are misunderstood and frequently rebuffed. We must stay united in God's plan for this church, his church. We must stop trusting in ourselves, in our own good intentions, in our efforts, and once again place our trust in the one who alone can save and sanctify us all. Paul's first words to this church, to us, are those of hope and confidence. Paul's confidence and hope are not in us as people, in our good intentions, or in our work ethic. His hope is in the one who called him, and who called the Corinthian believers as well, and now calls us. His hope is in the fact that God has abundantly provided for every spiritual need in our church. His hope is in the faithfulness of God, who started the good work in these believers and in us, and who is committed to bringing it to a completion. We do need to take note of Paul's words of warning and of instruction to us this evening. Simply stated, a divided church cannot serve God as he wants and deserves. But if there was hope for Saul as he was, and for the believers of Corinth as they were, then there's hope for everyone who lives within Rose Green and Aldwick. Everyone can find God.